It's not perfect. We know that there's upwards of 2 million people who need food on the ground who are hungry, innocent civilians who didn't ask for this conflict. And we're dropping meals in the tens of thousands. And even delivering that desperately needed food into Gaza is beyond challenging. Starving people killed and injured trying to reach aid trucks in a chaotic scene. Meanwhile, humanitarian workers say the situation is dire for people who took refuge in Gaza's largest hospital. Welcome to your world tonight. I'm Stephanie Skanderis. Also on the program. At least the, the change of government has uh, bring some calm, a small calm in the street. But any peace in Haiti is tenuous right now. Countries, including Canada, are trying to help form a transitional government. But the main gang leader says any foreign peacekeepers will be considered invaders. Later, it's the greatest time of the year for fans of U.S. college basketball. We'll tell you about the Canadians making their mark on March Madness and why the women's games are the real slam dunks. There's word today from Egypt that mediated ceasefire talks between Israel and Hamas are set to resume in Cairo tomorrow. In the meantime, Israel continues to strike dozens of targets in Gaza, including around its largest hospital. And as Chris Reyes reports, there is a new push to get aid into the territory, which is facing starvation. In Gaza, the scene of gunfire and a stampede shows the dangers of delivering aid to a population on the brink of famine. Ten trucks loaded with food crossed into Gaza at the Rafah border, but not without incident. According to witnesses, some were shots when Palestinians fired into the air, while others say the shots came from Israeli forces. The Palestine Red Crescent said at least five people were killed and dozens were hit by moving trucks as they tried to get food. Israeli forces have not commented on what happened, but at Al Shifa Hospital, Israeli officials say their offensive continues, claiming Hamas is still using it as a base. From humanitarian workers, a plea to get civilians out. Dr. Ghassan Abu Sita worked at the hospital, but he says he's now lost all contact with anyone inside. The patients who ha uh, and the internally displaced who had sought refuge inside the hospital are also trapped without water, without food. And there is a dire need to evacuate them. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Israel, hundreds of Israeli Arabs gathered to mark Land Day. They're marking the deadly day in 1976 when Israeli forces confiscated Palestinian land killing six unarmed Palestinians and injuring more than 100 during a protest. Kamal Khatib is the deputy head of the Islamic movement in Israel. He said the land to us is father, mother and religion. It is the past, present and the future. Another demonstrator, Madi Abed, said, We are here to commemorate Land Day, which we cherish, and to remember our martyrs, our land, our homeland, and the right that we will never give up. In Egypt, diplomatic talks continue to end the conflict, with leaders meeting in Cairo. Jordanian Foreign Minister Ayman Safadi said, all the countries in the international community bear the responsibility for these events, for the humanitarian situation. In Gaza, more than a million Palestinians have been displaced by the current conflict. Three more ships with 400 tons of food and other supplies have left the port in Cyprus, headed there. UN officials say famine in the enclave is imminent. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. And there are renewed fears that the Israel-Hamas conflict is widening across the region. Today, three UN observers and a translator were wounded by a strike in southern Lebanon. Israel is denying that it came from one of its drones, but there have been several clashes on the border with Lebanon between the Israeli military and the militant group Hezbollah. The UN calls the targeting of its peacekeepers unacceptable. Dozens of Canadian Armed Forces members have been deployed to Jamaica. 
They are there as part of a UN-backed mission to restore order to Haiti. According to Global Affairs Canada, the Canadian soldiers will train about 300 military personnel from Jamaica, Belize and the Bahamas. Haiti has been gripped by lawlessness after gangs violently seized much of the capital. Philip Lee Shenok reports. Children fly colorful paper kites, a popular Easter tradition in Haiti, a sign of how the tense situation in Port-au-Prince has quieted down somewhat since President Ariel Henry resigned weeks ago, says journalist Etienne Coté palouk At least the, the change of government has uh, bring some calm, a small calm in the street. The Presidential Transitional Council has been established to restore Haiti's democracy. According to the United Nations, gang violence in Haiti has killed more than 1,500 people so far this year. Cote Palouk says one prominent gang leader is demanding a seat at the table as a condition for any ceasefire. There is no really uh, political structures that are promoting talks with the gangs, at least the ones that uh, are in the council right now. But Jimmy Cherizier, the gang leader also known as Barbecue, says the lull in violence is only a temporary pause. In an interview with Sky News, he dismissed the transitional council as a tool for corrupt politicians and oligarchs to continue to run the country. Kenya has pledged to send 1,000 police officers to lead a UN-backed mission. Canada will train around 330 troops from Jamaica, Belize and the Bahamas to support the Kenyan-led mission. Cherizier says the gangs will resist any foreign peacekeeping force. I will consider them as aggressors, he says. We will consider them as invaders who have come to walk over our independence. Michael Dybert is the author of a recent book on Haiti. Cherizier, barbecue, I mean, he's definitely the most media savvy and the one most accessible to journalists but he's far from the, the most powerful one. So I think the idea that you could get all these guys to agree in terms of how to deal with the political and the security crisis going forward, I'm, I'm somewhat doubtful about that, unfortunately. And Dybert says he's skeptical that any gang leaders will be allowed to be involved in the transitional government. These are groups that have committed a lot of really terrible abuses uh, against the civilian population. And I think that could possibly, you know, derail um, any, any sort of a, a transition. The UN says the multinational security support force must deploy immediately to support the embattled Haitian National Police. And it says as many as 5,000 police officers will be needed to stop the gang violence and bring some semblance of stability back to Haiti. Philip Lichanoff, CBC News, Toronto. Turning down a prospective tenant because they have kids is illegal. But some parents in Nova Scotia say it's happening to them. Families who face this type of discrimination are being urged to report it to the province's Human Rights Commission. But as Nicholas Sagan reports, the system is so backed up, tenants are questioning whether making a complaint is even worth the time and effort. I called this person. He said, no kids. Mallory Gunn sifts through a list of more than 100 rentals she applied to over the past year desperate to find a home for herself and her two children. I begged, plead, cried. I've told my story about, you know, how I'm going to be homeless if I don't find a place um, just to give me a chance. Family status is a protected characteristic under the Human Rights Act. Nova Scotia's Human Rights Commission urges people to report this type of discrimination. But some families say it's not that easy. Uh, she heard Cora in the background and she was like, do you have a kid? And I was like, yeah, that's my daughter. I'm sorry. Uh, like, and then she's just like, like, no, we cannot rent this to you. And Giannisa, Adisa Putri, and Paul Ralph say a landlord told them of a no-child policy when they were searching for a rental in 2019. They did file a complaint with the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission, and an officer spoke to the landlord who admitted to the policy. But Ralph says that got them nowhere. We had that problem, and we did contact them, and... They basically ignored us for two years and then at the end of the two years just went, no. The Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission declined an interview about Ralph's case and the general complaints process. But the commission's own numbers tell a story. The average human rights complaint takes more than two years to be completed. Other provinces have similar backlogs, with an average wait of almost 600 days in Ontario. And in BC, it can take more than one year just for a case to be screened. 
The most common human rights decisions relate to employment, with few housing complaints. It can really deter tenants. Lee Webb, a lawyer with the Canadian Centre for Housing Rights, says that's because the plotting process can discourage people from reporting abuse. When it takes so long for a human rights commission or human rights tribunal to deal with a complaint, and you're dealing with tenants who are in the process of looking for housing, you know, they don't have a lot of time to spend starting a, a legal process. Uh, they'd much rather find another place to stay. For Gunn, this was exactly the yeah, case. I, just, I had to focus on getting a place. I just didn't have time. I have two kids. Um, I really just need to focus on that. After 11 months of searching, Gunn did find a place to live. But even in her relief, she hopes there can be meaningful change so other parents don't have to go through the same thing. Nicola Sagan, CBC News, Halifax. Vancouver is dealing with too much of a cute thing. Colonies of abandoned rabbits are making their nests in the city's suburbs, beaches, and even the airport. With animal shelters already overrun, people are leaving their unwanted pets outside, leading to a bunny boom. Georgie Smythe has the details. <laughs> rabbits hop around the grass at a park on the Vancouver waterfront. Thanks to bunny math, what started with just a few abandoned bunnies has grown into a population of hundreds, showing how sometimes the difference between a pet and a pest is time. It's been here for decades and it's growing. Sorrel Sademan founded the charity Rabbitats, which fights for the welfare of discarded and feral rabbits. The odd rabbit here and there takes a while, but when you're abandoning a lot in one place, you can have an explosive colony pretty quickly. Explosive because rabbits can start having babies as young as four months old, and they can birth a litter every 30 days. These are all rabbit homes here. For years, authorities have discouraged the abandonment and feeding of rabbits in Vancouver's parks, but the city's animal shelters are overrun and they're no longer accepting surrenders. Many feel it's more humane to set them loose outside than have them euthanized. Advocates are expecting a bunny boom just in time for Easter. It's sad, um, like they are domestic rabbits, so ultimately they don't belong outdoors. Um. Some are rehomed and end up in outreach places like the Vancouver Bunny Cafe. Chelsea Refuse is the welfare manager. So all of them come to us through the rescue um, and they come from all different situations. Some of them were owner surrenders, some of them were bunnies that were abandoned in the wild. Some of them might have been born in the shelter or even born in the wild. Customers pay to feed, cuddle and for people like Clea Griffin, maybe adopt the bunnies. I think my bunny would like a friend but I have it in my room so I don't really want two bunnies in my room. But the rabbits can't be rehomed fast enough and the supply of bunnies in the great outdoors just keeps growing. Here's Sademan again. People think they're doing them a favour by feeding them and they have bigger litters of babies more often and they're well supported and we end up with a lot more rabbits. Caitlin Mitchell, the Director of Legal Advocacy at Animal Justice, says the rabbits would be better looked after from a provincial, not municipal level. We can all see that the existing patchwork of municipal approaches is not working. Often provinces regulate the breeding of dogs, for instance, for very good reason. But we also need to start to regulate the breeding of rabbits as well as the sale of rabbits. Sterilization is one way to slow this rapid rabbit growth, but it's a fix that needs provincial buy-in fast. Without intervention, the problem will just keep multiplying. Georgie Smythe, CBC News, Vancouver. Still ahead, shaking up genres, raking in accolades. Beyonce's new album, Cowboy Carter, is out. We look at how it helps break down barriers for black country artists. And the trailblazer you might never have heard of, who's now in Beyonce's spotlight. That's all coming up on Your World Tonight. Officials in Baltimore say it could take weeks for the city's port to reopen after the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge earlier this week. Maryland Governor Wes Moore says the Army Corps has begun clearing debris from the river to clear a path for boats to reach the port. This is not just about Maryland. This is about our nation's economy. The port handles more cars and more farm equipment, more than any other port inside this country. And at least 8,000 workers on the docks 
have jobs that have been directly affected by this collapse. Clearing the wreckage is also essential to recovering the bodies of four construction workers who are missing and presumed dead. Moore says rescue divers will go back in the water to search for remains once the conditions are safe enough. India's prime minister is leaning on a potent mix of religion and celebrity in the upcoming national election. Narendra Modi's Hindu first policies have him leading in polls, but he isn't taking any chances. Modi is fielding a number of high-profile candidates, including an actor best known for playing a Hindu god on TV. Freelance reporter Neha Punya has more. Loud chants hailing the Hindu god Ram welcome Arun Govil. The actor is considered by many to be a reincarnation of the deity himself. Nearly 40 years ago, he played Ram in a television series based on the Hindu epic Ramayan. At the peak of its popularity, millions of Indians would pray to him and light incense sticks in front of their television sets. And now Govil is banking on his fame to become a first-time parliamentarian from his hometown of Meerut. I'm grateful I've been given a chance to return to my roots. This time the BJP will win 400 seats, I'm sure. Running Arun Govil as a BJP candidate in the state of Uttar Pradesh is deliberate. In January, Prime Minister Narendra Modi grabbed international headlines by inaugurating a temple dedicated to Lord Ram in that state. Ram Bharat ki chetna hai. Ram Bharat ka... Lord Ram is India's faith and foundation. He's the idea of India. It's consciousness, thinking, prestige and glory. Author Nilanjan Mukhopadhyay has written a biography on Modi. Being popular comes to him primarily because of pursuing majoritarian politics. You know, it is a Hindu first politics, you know, which is always specified. But there is always a, the policy has a thrust which is alienating the religious minorities, especially the Muslims. The Ram Mandir or the temple for Lord Ram is being built on the site of a former mosque, which was raised by a right-wing mob three decades ago. A recent poll found 60% of all respondents believed that the temple is something to be proud of. This week, as he canvassed across Meerut, Arun Govil slipped seamlessly into the role of Lord Ram, narrating dialogues from the TV series. And locals are impressed. He's like God himself. We are thrilled he's contesting from our constituency. If he wins, he will surely do great things for us. It's a great idea by the BJP to field him. I'm sure he'll prioritize working on issues that matter to residents like me. Uttar Pradesh has more seats in parliament than any other state. In 2019, the BJP won three quarters of the seats there. This time, the party has its sights set on electing 400 MPs out of a possible 543 nationwide. And to do that, they'll be counting on the likes of Arun Govil to stay in character. Neha Punya for CBC News, New Delhi. In Peru. Police force their way into the home of President Dina Boluarte, searching for luxury watches she had not declared. Police began investigating Boluarte after local media reported she owned several Rolexes. When asked how she afforded the watches on a public salary, Boluarte said they are the product of working hard since she was 18 years old. Peru's prime minister defended President Boluarte, calling the police raid disproportionate and unconstitutional. It's a big weekend in U.S. college basketball, March Madness, and of course there are Canadians in the mix. Also this year, the women's tournament is making history. For the first time, tickets for the women's final four games have outsold the men's six times. Some call it the Caitlin Clark effect. The superstar player for the Iowa Hawkeyes is now the all-time leading scorer in college basketball for men and women. For more on all the action, I spoke to freelance reporter Ed Kleiman. He's in Albany watching some of the games. Ed, you've been watching Caitlin Clark's Iowa Hawkeyes take on the Colorado Buffaloes. What makes Caitlin Clark such a special player? 
Wow, she is incredible. I have to say, sitting courtside, I've got a whole new appreciation for what her talent level is. It's off the charts. So whether it's scoring with high arcing rainbow three pointers or driving through five players to get to the basket, she does it all. And she passes brilliantly. She sees things that no other player sees. So no surprise to me that she averages nine assists a game to lead, lead, lead the nation, in addition to 31 points per game scoring. On top of that, she rebounds. She plays great defense. In the timeouts, she's leading the other teams in terms of where they need to be. You know, she's just everywhere, doing everything. I can't say enough about Caitlin Clark. She really blows me away. <laughs> But you know we've got the biggest soft spots for the Canadians. So can you tell me about the Canadian talent that you're seeing there in the women's game? Yeah, there's a lot of talent behind Caitlin Clark in this tournament. There's no doubt about that. And while Caitlin Clark is a flashy, finesse guard, the other end of the spectrum is the power forward position. And when you look at the award that's going to go up for the power forward of the year, there are two Canadians out of the five finalists. One of those, Aaliyah Edwards, will be playing a big game tonight, looking to advance with her Connecticut Huskies. She has been amazing. The problem for her is a couple of weeks ago, she broke her nose. So she's had to play through this tournament with one of those plastic shields. Oh, no. Really uncomfortable. Yeah, so difficult. But you know what? She is as tough as they come. It hasn't slowed her down a beat. She's been great, and I think that team looks great. So, so look for her. The other great power forward uh, is Yvonne Ejim. And unfortunately, she lost last night to Texas with her Gonzaga Bulldogs. But she had a great game, as she's had all season long. She, like Aaliyah Edwards, will be playing in the WNBA next year. I expect both of them will be in the first round, probably. So those are two examples of the kind of amazing women's talent that Canada has uh, going right now. Pretty impressive stuff. Now, over on the men's side, it is hard to look past Zach Eady, and not just because he is 7'4". <laughs> Can you tell me about this superstar from Toronto who plays for Purdue? What an amazing story. This guy was player of the year in the United States last year. And they had this huge upset where they lost in the first round of the NCAA tournament. One of the biggest in tournament history. No one saw it coming. He was going to go into the NBA, everyone thought. But then after that happened, he came back. Wanted to be better himself. Wanted to make this team better. Wanted another chance. And wow, has he taken advantage of that opportunity. He is just unstoppable three games played in the tournament three blowouts for Purdue and he's put up numbers that we haven't seen since 1970 uh, in terms of the points scored with 80 and rebounds with 45 these are numbers that just blow the mind away so he has been absolutely no doubt about it I mean it figuratively I mean it literally he is the big story of the men's <laughs> tournament and Purdue has a legitimate chance to win this whole title. Oh, wow. So, I mean, we're reaching the end of this tournament. What are some of the matchups you're looking forward to? You know, the, these tournaments are known for big upsets. Uh, and so I think one storyline I'm following in terms of a Cinderella story that's still around on the men's side is North Carolina State. They had to win five games in five days to get out of their conference because they were one of the worst teams in the conference, but they managed to beat all the top teams and get to the tournament. And then once they were there, they haven't stopped. They've been upsetting great teams in the tournament. They're all the way into the, into the Elite Eight, which is just phenomenal. And then I'm talking about dominant teams on the other end of the spectrum. And on the women's tournament, that's South Carolina. 35 games played, 35 victories. It's very rare to go undefeated. But if there's a team that can do it, it's South Carolina. So there are some great storylines in both tournaments, whether it's underdogs or overdogs. This tournament never fails to disappoint. It's so much fun, and uh, we've still got a long way to go yet. Ah, Ed, so much to watch. Always so great to chat. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stephanie. Freelance reporter Ed Kleiman in Albany. You are listening to Your World Tonight from CBC News. I'm Stephanie Skanderis. You can hear Your World Tonight and other CBC radio programs wherever you are on your favorite podcast app. Cowboy Carter is a little bit country, a little bit R&B, a little pop, and 100% Beyonce. On her new album, Queen Bee is putting her own brand on honky-tonk music and kicking the saloon doors open for other black country singers who have felt sidelined by Nashville. Mac de Gabriel Selassie reports. This ain't Texas. With this song, Beyonce already made history, the first black woman to top Billboard's Hot Country Songs chart. 
And since then, other black country artists say their fan base is growing. My reel went to 100,000 something, you know, views and then all these followers came out. I'm pretty strong. Canadian artist Sasha has been following her country music dreams for years. Now, after she was mentioned in an article about Beyonce, new fans are finding their way to her. You know, people of all sorts of diverse backgrounds and uh, that were coming out of the woodwork, like, hey, how come I haven't heard it? Wow, I love this. Or It was actually a really positive. It's a wave of positivity that for Beyonce started with pushback. On social media, she expressed she felt unwelcome in the genre before, likely linked to the response she got for performing with the chicks at the CMA Awards. With Cowboy Carter, she taps into country and blends in other genres too. There's an updated cover of Jolene, also featured Linda Martell, the first black woman to play solo at the Grand Ole Opry. I think it's a thrilling moment. Country songwriter Alice Randall has written about black country's past, present and future. Before Beyonce, she started seeing a shift. I talk about a renaissance that's happening in black country because we have Rihanna Giddens, we have Reese Palmer, we have Alison Russell, all have been contributing extraordinary music. While there are a number of black artists making their mark now, getting regular play is still a problem, says University of Ottawa assistant professor Jada Watson. Really uh, airplay for black artists or indigenous artists or Mexican-American artists really remains at about 1.2% over the last five years. Before getting play comes the genre classifications. I am ready. Alberta's Dorje says they find they have to make some tough choices. Like when I apply like to put my music in the Junos and stuff like that, like I'm making a choice. If I want to stay true to myself, I want to enter in the country album, but there's no way I'm getting votes. If I go into the alternative routes that I have, I'm probably going to have a better probability of getting the vote. They say more progress needs to be made, but they're hoping the future will see other black artists top the country charts just like Beyonce. Mark de Gebrecelasse, CBC News, Toronto. Holy night on a long black road. On a... <laughs> okay, thank you so very much. As you heard from Macda, Beyonce's new album features Linda Martell. Genres are a funny little concept, aren't they? Yes, they are. There's a man in my house, he's so big and strong. Linda Martell was a trailblazer, but one that a lot of people haven't heard of. She was born in South Carolina in 1941, the daughter of a sharecropper, and was discovered while singing at the Charleston Air Force Base, moving to Nashville in 1969, where she released her only album, Color Me Country. It was the first major country release by a black woman. She was also the first black woman to perform solo at the Grand Ole Opry. Her song, Color Him Father, peaked at number 22 on the country chart. I think I'll color him father. I think I'll color him love. But her career would be a battle. For one thing, her label was called Plantation Records. Worse, she'd face racist taunts and jeers from white audience members. Management told her to develop thicker skin. Eventually, she left them, but her career never recovered, and she returned to South Carolina, eventually driving a bus for the local school district. Living and working in the city, I thought I was a big girl. Linda Martell is now 82. On Instagram, she says she's proud that Beyonce is exploring her country music roots and she's honored to be part of it. There's also a Linda Martell documentary coming, made by her granddaughter and called Bad Case of the Country Blues. I feel the thing that I did in country music, nobody can ever equal. The title is a play on one of Linda Martell's songs, Bad Case of the Blues. We'll leave you with some of that on your world tonight. I'm Stephanie Skanderis. Thank you for listening. Good night. <laughs>